Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator all right so um thanks for having me here my name is chatty alhaj i'm here in uh the metro Detroit area, our practice is in Royal Oak, uh, Michigan, and uh, we have a, a perioprosthodontic practice uh, with a full service laboratory. Um, we focus a lot on comprehensive treatment. Um, a lot of it is focused around implant dentistry, um, but we still do a lot of traditional treatments, crown and bridge, uh, removal prosthodontics and whatnot. Um, but I'll go ahead and just get right into it. If anything along the way, just go ahead and stop me or, okay. or ask. Them. So, um, so I'm I'm born and raised here in Michigan. Um, I did all my training here at uh, University of Michigan. I went to college, dental school, um, and I did my prosthodontic uh, training certificate and my master's uh, there as well. I taught at the University of Detroit Mercy um, for several years as well when I was first out of school. Uh, while I was, you know, building my practice and whatnot. And then, uh, you know, we run several study clubs and lectures um, locally around the area and, and um, around the country as well. So, uh, you know, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, um, you know, the main focus in our practice and, and one of the main treatments that we offer and that we do um, is the all-on-four treatment or sometimes referred to as uh, revitalize, um, neo arch, depending on, you know, the company that you might be working with, but essentially it's the replacement of, of natural teeth or the removal of natural teeth and replacement with implants and some sort of fixed, um, prosthesis. Typically it's done in one day. Some cases, um, are not always in that fashion. Um, but mainly what I'm going to be talking to you about today is, um, you know, the removal of teeth, immediate placement or delayed placement of implants, um, or the immediate placement or the de delayed placement of a restoration, be it a single multi-unit um, or, or the full arch. Um, and then, you know, I have several cases that I'll go through and then we'll have some time if anybody has any questions and whatnot. Um, so I, you know, I typically I just kind of go through some of the nomenclature um, depending on where you are and, and, and whatnot, um, a lot of these words have been interchangeable. Um, but mainly, you know, as far as conversation today, um, an immediate, immediate placement is placement of an implant at the time of extraction. So you remove the tooth and you immediately put that implant in um, during the same appointment time. Uh, early placement is typically done um, a short time or period after the tooth is removed. Uh, and conventional placement is what a lot of us are familiar with is removing the tooth, uh, typically grafting the site and then waiting um, anywhere from four to six months or I should say three to four to maybe six months um, for that site to heal. Um, I'd say about three quarters of our patients are immediate placement. Um, usually anything in the bicuspid forward, except if the site is, is not adequate. Um, not a lot of early placement, um, really not much at all. And then conventional placements, you know, removing grafting and, and waiting. Now, as far as loading, when we're talking about putting teeth on the implants or some sort of restoration, um, immediate loading is when the restoration is placed on the implant. Typically, um, you know, we say within the first week, but typically that is um, done at the time of the implant placement. Um, early loading is within the first uh, six to eight weeks. That's not done as much. Um, I typically only do something like that um, really when 
it's an emergency. Um, you know, if your occlusion is off or if there's some sort of fracture in the material and you have to switch them out, um, try not to really unscrew and screw on and off of implants during that time period, just because uh, your torque kind of drops off a little bit during the healing process. So you just don't want to cause any, any, is any issues with integration. Uh, conventional loading is, you know, uh, within three to four to six months after placement. So a lot of times we, we, we confuse, the, you know, from the surgery to the restoration part because a lot of these terms, you know, immediate early conventional loading um, and placing. Um, so remember, you could remove a tooth, let it heal for four months, place an implant, and then immediate load it. Or you might remove a tooth, place the implant immediately, and load it immediately. So a lot of these things can happen in, in several different fashions and, and forms. So when we talk about the difference, you know, how do we how do we make these decisions? Um, you know, there are obviously um, a tremendous number of factors that you can spend hours, days, weeks talking about the differences and whatnot. I'll just kind of run through um, some of the main things, but. Um, when I talk about an immediate implant or placing something immediately, um, it's a very technique sensitive procedure um, because now it's requiring you to um, remove the tooth using the socket that's there. It may not be ideal. Um, preparing to place the implant, you still want your implant to be placed in an ideal fashion, obviously. Um, and so it just requires a little bit more skill on the, on the surgery side, for, um, for example. Um, you have to kind of plan for something like this because, you know, it's, it's as we call it, a game day decision. Um, you can always plan for something like this, but until you remove the tooth and actually try to place the implant, sometimes it may work out, sometimes it won't work out for you. So you have to consider... Um, a backup restoration, you know, if this is a, a you know, a central incisor or, or front tooth and you don't have any type of removable appliance that can be used for the patient to walk out of the office with a tooth in place in case you cannot place the implant for them with some sort of restoration, if that was what you're planning for, you have to just kind of plan backup, backup, backup. So, you know, one of the beauties is you know, if somebody comes in with a fracture, um, you can essentially cut down their treatment time by 80%. Um, you know, what would take eight to 10 months of just surgery and healing, if you're able to, you know, remove the tooth, place the implant, and place an immediate restoration on the tooth, um, you could have a final restoration on this, on this implant within a three to four month period of time. Um, rather, like I said, you know, waiting eight to 10 months for he just healings from surgeries and then another couple of months as far as developing your restoration. Um, you know, for me, one of the very important factors that I take into consideration is um, where the soft tissues are. So you can see on a case like this front tooth, um, this was an individual that had, uh, this guy, it's kind of interesting, just had crowns placed on the forefront teeth. Um, this young man is a, a orthopedic resident. And, you know, during surgery, they, they use hammers and um, all sorts of just, you know, hitting and, and whatnot. And they were trying to remove a rod from a knee. And as it came out, the one resident pulled it out and his elbow came and hit him and hit the other young man in the front and just broke the tooth in half. And so this was an ideal situation because there was no infection. There was, you know, no noted pathology. It was a clean break. We were able to preserve the natural crown um, of his tooth as well. And what we did was we removed the root. We placed an implant for him. We used the old existing restoration. I, I, I removed the tooth. Um, and we used that as a temporary for the patient. So we were able to... Um, preserve his papilla, his embrasure spaces, um, and kind of keep everything the same. Um, and, you know, for an individual who's working five, six days a week and doesn't have time and all, it, it worked out really well. Um, you know, there's also other issues that you'll see as, as we go through here. Um, there's a lot of factors that you have to take into consideration if you're going to do something like this. 
um, your patient really has to understand what you're doing. If this patient that you saw before left my office and went and bit into an apple right away on this, you know, fresh new implant that's in an extraction socket with grafted bone and a tooth on it. If he went and started engaging into foods and whatnot, um, you know, he could most, well, he will most likely cause the implant to fail or potentially break his provisional. Um, so one thing that we look at is obviously patient compliance, patient hygiene, you know, is this an individual that will be able to take care of the site, understand your instruction, follow your instruction, um, occlusion, you have to look at the occlusion because that's important. If there is malocclusion or if there's not a healthy occlusion or a stabilized bite, um, you have to take that into consideration because uh, they can cause a lot of parafunction, a lot of destruction. So for example, you see there in the photo, that is your, you know, your typical class two deep bite patient, um, where if they were to fracture one of their anterior teeth, there may not be a lot of restorative space uh, for that implant or a lot of clearance between the jaws, allowing the patient to kind of um, separate adequately without causing a lot of interference. So if they're banging on that tooth a lot, or if they're um, functioning, or, or as we say, riding or, or, or parafunctioning back and forth on that tooth, um, that's not a good situation because that's just constant mobility on an implant that you don't want. Um, other little things that we take in the, you know, your soft tissue profiles, I'll show you some charts and some indexes that we use um, to score patients um, to kind of see if they're a healthy candidate or a poor candidate. Um, big thing for me is just patient expectations. You have to have a realist, realistic conversation with your patient. Um, and I tell them, if this is something that you will not be able to sustain, um, or if you really don't think you're going to be able to take care of this and follow the instruction, just place the implant, wear a removable appliance for a few months until the implant integrates. Um, and then we'll put the restoration on there. So you just have to make sure you have informed consent. Um, so when we're talking about placing an implant, what we're looking for really is primary stability. Um, we're usually looking at torque values of anywhere from about 25 to 35 newton centimeters and above. Uh, most of our patients that we're immediately loading are usually anywhere in the 50, 55 and above range. Uh, for example, you know, an all on four patient, if you're placing four to six implants, um, you know, they may all not torque in at 50, 55 newtons. It's something, you know, you may have one or two implants. Um, that torque in at, you know, 10, 15, 25 newtons, just because it might be an area where there's soft bone, we'll still load because the majority of our implants have torqued in well. Um, even sometimes we've had three, four implants that torque in really well and one or two that are just spinning in place. We still load, um, you know, make sure your occlusion is good. Patients were in their soft splint and uh, those implants will integrate to the bone. There are a lot of uh, ways that you can kind of measure the stability. Um, you have, you know, ISQ monitors, all the sorts of equipment. Um, you can tap on the implant. Um, for us, mainly, it's when we're placing these implants, um, replaced by by uh, hand motor. Um, and so we know when they're going in. You know, we get the 35 newtons. The implants, you know, a third of the way in. You get. You go up to 45 newtons, goes halfway in, you go up to 55 newtons, and implant finishes going in. And sometimes you have to finish it by hand. And so, you know, you you were pretty confident at that point that, you know, this thing went in at a very high high torque value. And obviously, too, as you as you place more and more and more and more, you just kind of have a, a feel for these things. Um, us, personally, in the office, we don't use any of the gadgets or any of the measuring devices. Um, like I said, we just go off of the F of the placement torque, essentially. Primary stability, very important. Um, some of the factors that can affect um, your bone quality, you know, mandible versus maxilla bone. Um, if there was an infection present, if it's grafted bone, um, where in the, you know, anatomically, where in the jaw this implant is being placed. Uh, insertion torque, like we were talking about just now, is the torque value that your implant is being inserted um, into the jawbone. And then obviously surgical technique. Um, 
you know, if you have placed a million implants, you know, you know, just feeling types of bone, you know, you kind of have a sense of how much you should prep your osteotomy. If it's a four millimeter diameter implant, uh, obviously, you know, in the maxilla, if it's very soft bone, you may not prep all the way up that high and you may not have to tap the site. You may have to only drill, you know, a two millimeter or 2.4 millimeter osteotomy and be able to get your implant in uh, afterwards. Um, the mandible, for example, you may have to tap the bone in order to insert. So, you know, surgical technique is very important. It kind of umbrellas the other, you know, your bone quality, um, your an, an, uh, anatomy, um, your placement technique and type of implant. A lot of that kind of falls under the surgeon's hand. So it, a lot of it is really um, in your hands as far as, you know, how you are um, placing these implants. Um, for us, a lot of times, if we're having a hard time um, getting torque, we sometimes have to, you know, uh, for placing a 10 millimeter implant, take it out, get a, a 13 or 14, 15 millimeter implant. So that way maybe we can engage some cortical bone and go a little bit deeper. So um, your, your technique is, is very, very important and having a good understanding of the other factors as well all contribute to that. You know, we we'll talk about anatomy uh, when we're deciding, you know, what can be placed immediately versus what should be built. There's different type of sockets. Obviously, when you see a type one socket, you can see you have good bone. What we're really looking for in a lot of these cases is that facial bone height. Um, if there is a deficient amount of facial bone, typically it hinders or it makes it harder to place the implant. Whereas uh, if you have good facial bone, um, it makes it a lot easier. Um, you know, it comes down a lot to your personal preference. Um, you know, how do I say? Basically, when I look at a site um, or in our practice, when we look at a site, we always try to shoot for what would be the most natural route. Um, you know, so I'll give you an example. Sometimes we'll look at there's some bone loss between teeth. And let's say you're going to take out some central incisors. Um, by the time you remove the teeth, if you don't graft the sites, um, and you place the implant, let's say you have a five, six, or seven millimeter pocketing um, or, or, you know, difference from the adjacent tooth to CEJ to where your implant platform is. Um, you know, we take that into consideration because if my implant platform is five or seven millimeters less than where the CEJ is of the adjacent tooth is, yeah, sure, I can put an implant in, it'll integrate. Um, I can restore it with a tooth and, you know, you can put pink porcelain and cosmetically do what you got to do, but it could create a very, very serious hygiene issue for the patient cleaning around that implant. So, you know, we always explore the option of, you know, should we, should we build some bone? Should we graft some bone to try to, or, you know, should we graft some tissue from the roof of our mouth? Um, you know, just about every patient gets, a soft tissue graft just to increase the tissue around there so you have more and more. So you have to really look at these sockets and sites with a lot of detail and envision kind of where your restoration is going to be and how things kind of fit together um, so that we're not just, you know, randomly just placing things and just putting restorations on and, you know, creating a another issue down the road such as peri-implantitis. Um, Next couple slides are just some charts. Um, can always make these available to individuals. Um, like I had mentioned earlier, these are just some, you know, um, indexes that we use to kind of what we say score patients um, or kind of categorize patients as far as their classifications of, you know, whether they're a good case or not good case for an implant placement. You can see um, you know, buckle bone, implant technique, um, expected results, and indication, things that you just kind of take into consideration or that help you kind of realize this is a, a good risk or is it a high risk, a low risk. Once again, when we're looking at the sockets, you have to have an idea how do we want to place the implant. Um, once again, going back to the, to the same conversation as far as building bone, 
this is something else that we look at. Um, I think, you know, I, I caught the tail end of the last lecture and we're talking about um, radiographs and stuff for placing implants. In our office, every single patient gets a CT scan. Um, we, we won't, we won't treat you and we won't place an implant on you if we don't take a CT scan on you. Um, obviously there's a lot of, you know, x-rays, uh, periapical x-rays, radiographs and whatnot that we'll take during surgery as we need. Um, but as far as planning and treatment planning your case, and if it's an implant case, whether it's a single multiple, uh, case, um, without a CT scan, we, we just, we really won't treat you. Um, and so now, you know, a lot of folks have conversation, you know, just get the implant in. If it's off angle, you can correct for it with a custom abutment and whatnot. Um, and that's fine. In a lot of cases, we still kind of just as we look at our ridges and where our implants are going to be and how the restorations fit on, on top of it. Um, we also look at, you know, how is this restoration going to fit in place? Um, if I have to place, you know, if I'm replacing a central incisor and my implant is going to be very facially angulated, um, well, if it's not going to allow me to develop an ideal restoration that is acceptable to the patient, um, then this is something we have to take into consideration. Um, we really try to plan for just about everything to be screw retained. Um, I really try to avoid cementing stuff um, just to create, you know, lay less or, you know, reduce a margin, reduce a cement barrier, an area, you know, where um, food and plaque can accumulate. And then honestly, one of the big things is retrievability is I like the idea that I can unscrew and screw these um appliances or these restorations off because um, we have a large, large population of patients who will start with one or two implants. And sure enough, over time, we may be adding one or two other implants. So I need to be able to uh, remove an existing restoration and possibly fabricate a new restoration um, that joins more implants later on. Um, so we always take that into consideration when we're placing, we try to place for screw retain. Um, obviously in some cases you can't do that. Um, but it does raise the conversation as, as well, you know, um, do I build bone and graft more bone so I can put an implant in a more ideal position or do I just go with what I have and try to, you know, make it as best as I can. This is another, you know, little scorecard. I won't really divulge too much into it, but just kind of shows you the aesthetic risk factors, low, medium, and high, and uh, several factors that we take into consideration from medical health to smoking to infections to um, soft tissues. Um, these are all things that you take into consideration when deciding if your patient is low, medium, or high risk. This is another example of looking at outline forms of um, soft tissue and papilla. Um, you know, when you, you know, if a patient comes to you and you make the decision to remove the tooth, place an implant and restoration one shot, um, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're wagering more at one time of hoping that everything works out just fine. And as I'm sure you can imagine is, is if you take on something like this and aesthetically, if you start running into issues or you start getting black triangles around your implants, um, or on your, I'm sorry, you're on your restoration, um, or have a soft tissue issue. Um, you know, it can be very uncomfortable and displeasing for your patient in dealing with it. So, you know, this is just another, um, you know, uh, scoring, as I say, of how we evaluate patients, what we're looking for as far as what will be low risk versus high risk. Um, and having an understanding of soft tissue is very, very important. The different bio types of gingiva. This is another, you know, degree of risk um, that is used as well. A lot of these are, you know, very famous, um, old, you know, some older now um, papers and literature that talk about the immediate placement of implants, immediate loading. You know, Tarnow um, has done a tremendous amount of uh, studies and just, I mean, in dentistry in general has really pushed, pushed the implant dentistry field forward a lot. Um, Paulo Malo, you know, has a lot of, 
literature, a lot of research on the all-on four. Um, you know, now we're looking at 2025 year post-op data, um, and you know, prognosis-wise, you know, anywhere from 98 to even 100 percent success rates. So, you know, we know these things work. Um, they work, and they work pretty well. Um, you just have to know what you're doing. So, you know, now when we start to look at some of the cases, you know, you can replace single teeth, multiple teeth, full teeth. An example like this is this is a patient that came in, you know, they have present with some pain um, and some symptoms on the bicuspid tooth. You know, every time I bite or chew, I get a sharp shooting pain. So we get our bite stick out and we start measuring and we notice, hey, there's a big crack right there in the mesial um, aspect of that bicuspid you know, to the point where you can get an instrument in there. So we get a CT uh, image. We start planning where our implant position is going to go. As you can see in that, you know, that middle cross section right there, you can kind of see where the implant is going in the bone versus where the tooth is um, or where the natural tooth is. Because you got to remember when the tooth comes out, you're left with a big hole there. So there, you, know, you, know, you need to be able to drill into something or engage some type of bone to get that implant in there. Tooth is removed, um, the implant is placed, implant is always placed towards the palatal just because um, you don't want to be too close to your buccal bone just because you get a little bit of suck back and resorption of that bone over time. Um, particulate uh, cadaver bone or you know, graft bone is placed in there. Um, and then that is our temporary cylinder that the restoration is made to fit on. Restoration is finished in the lab. Always good to have a little analog on there. It's hard to hold on to these things as you're polishing. You really, really, really want to get a nice polish. Um, we use a lot of uh, like Palisil, for example, just to seal the um, intaglio surface or the surface that's going to fit into the gum or where the bone is. Uh, because you have to remember, you know, your patient's not going to be flossing this area or brushing this area for a while. Um, so if you're creating a restoration that has undercuts or ledges or is very rough, it's going to accumulate a lot of plaque, and that can lead to a very disastrous outcome. Um, so it's very good to just really polish these areas and take a lot of consideration into your contours of how you want to develop your tissues um, for the patient. So we always roughen up the cylinder so we get a good bond of material in there so nothing comes apart. Our temporary is in place. You can see there's some space. It's out of occlusion. It does not touch the teeth as the patient grinds. Um, we always make um, some sort of soft guard or retainer for the patient to wear at night just for grinding. And then obviously the patient knows um, they're not eating on that tooth. They're not biting on that tooth. Um, they're very, very conscious. And that comes back to what I was talking about earlier is your compliance. This is an example, is a young lady, um, their general dentist attempted a crown on the front tooth and um, sometime after the crown was placed, there was a fracture. This was a tooth that was endotreated, post-treated, multiple crowns. Um, and finally, I think she had bit into the, to the wrong food and it just kind of snapped at the gum line. So what we did was similar to what we looked at earlier. We removed the tooth. You can see a beautiful socket, no infection, nice healthy bone, nice and clean. But what we're worried about is that papilla. So our implant is placed, we put some bone in and around that site. You can see a connective tissue graft is done. We take tissue from the roof of your mouth. I'd rather come back and just remove a little bit of tissue than to have a restoration that's one millimeter larger than the adjacent and, and, and introduce asymmetry into, into the smile. So this is our, our temporary uh, cylinder that the uh, provisional is going to be bonded onto. Um, I think I've, you know, I've always kind of joke at this part, you know, they make, they make these things so big. Um, so what I did is we have a, a retainer of what things look like before. Um, so that's used to fit in place. We cut down that temporary cylinder. And what I did was once again, is I took her crown off the tooth. I slowly drilled a hole through the backside of it. And I was able to fit it back in place with the retainer. And 
you can kind of see the backside there. I just fill some composite in there. And that's what the back portion looks like. And that's how she kind of leaves the office there. Just a couple, couple sutures. You know, there's some tissue under there. There's some bone in there. That's her crown, her restoration. How things are healing. Tissues are resorbed. You know, and then eventually you can see how that papilla fills in. And we've eliminated, um, you know, any, any loss of tissue. We've preserved what she had there. Um, you can see symmetry-wise things look um, very, very nicely. You, that's really, you know, what you're looking for when you remove these restorations. You can see that papilla, that scaffolding. Um, obviously, you know, you now on the lab side, you have to be able to create a restoration that mimics exactly what you have in place. So that way, all the hard work on the surgery side, you don't want to lose it. And this happens, I can't tell you how many times this has happened, um, where there may be a miscommunication with the lab or, or whatever the case is. Um, you put a restoration in place and it doesn't meet the soft tissue and you start to, that tissue starts to kind of fall inwards um, a little bit. So you just want to really pay close attention. Nowadays with scanning technology, um, it makes things a lot easier because you can scan the restorations before you do ever do anything and replicate what was there. Um, you can do a scan at this point and scan the tissues and then you can actually replicate the central or the neighboring central incisor, you can use the software and just mirror image uh, that tooth. So that way you're developing the, a tooth that fits the contours that you've developed and um, tooth form is identical to what is there. Um, and then with a good ceramist is just, you know, shading and coloring, you'll have something that looks very, very natural in there and, and hopefully um, satisfies your patient. That's another view. If you can see what the socket looks like around the implant, and that's the restoration in place. Now, this is one aspect when we talk about partially dentalist. Um, I'll be honest with you, I, uh, I, I don't do a lot of the um, bridge cases anymore unless it's really, really comes up in conversation and it's important to the patient. Um, really try to avoid um, immediate loading posterior um, single or, or bridge teeth just because um, I'm always worried about grinding, clenching, um, and functioning on that side. Um, you know, it's easy with one tooth to kind of control things, take it out of a conclusion. But even, you know, a posterior segment like this, as you can see from bicuspid to molar, even if it's taken out of occlusion, you know, your patient can still very easily accidentally bite or or you know, chew something hard the wrong way and cause some sort of movement. This was a unique case because as you can see, um, this was an old bridge from bicuspid to molar that fractured off at the gum line. Um, and so we took it upon ourselves to put some immediate implants and load it, uh, mainly because you can see here, we, we only immediately placed the implant in the, uh, in the bicuspid area, the other two implants are placed in the fresh bone. Um, that's, you know, bone where obviously teeth were removed years ago. Um, it was very good bone. We kept the back tooth as well um, since it was restorable. Um, and what we did was we made a restoration um, that fit in place on both implants and on the natural tooth at the same time. Now, I normally I will never splint natural teeth and implants in any type of final restoration. Um, in the interim, though, I'm uh, I'm okay with it um, because this eventually turned into um, a a three three tooth bridge supported by three implants and a natural tooth in the back. So it worked out really well for our patient. Um, now, as we move on to the bigger type of treatments, the full arch type of treatments, and really, in a nutshell, when we look at the diagnostic workup for a full arch restoration. Um, this is something that you want to treat as a immediate denture per se. Um, because really what you're doing is, is you're taking out an individual's teeth. Um, and if you can imagine placing immediate dentures, um, it's the same thing that you're doing, except um, those immediate dentures are going to get screwed in place. And a lot of the excess material of the denture 
is going to get cut apart and is going to get uh, removed. Um, but all of these full arch patients, just like anybody else, um, they have to go through a, a records appointment um, where we start collecting information. It is a full series of photographs, um, side profiles, front repos, um, everything. Um, models, mounted models on the articulator, diagnostic wax up. Um, typically now we are scanning and digitizing these cases and then overlooking things with the CT scan because you have to start figuring out, you know, we're removing your teeth. We're going to anatomically change the shape of your jaw bones by, you know, reducing bone, smoothing bone out. We're going to place a series of implants that need to be able to support the teeth and support the teeth for the rest of your life. Um, so you really have to spend a lot of time planning where things are going to fit. Um, because the last thing you want to do is miss something and get to a point where it affects your restoration. And that can be a very unpleasant scenario to be in. So there's several different types of models of teeth. Um, you have where you could create the fixed crown and bridge, meaning um, typically six to eight implants are placed in a jaw and the implants are can be restored with custom abutments and bridges that cement onto them or uh, screw retained uh, units. The, these are typically restorations that have no pink tissue. Um, you're utilizing the patient's gum tissue. Um, it is more difficult doing this, but um, this is a more natural result. Um, the more popular procedure that you see in the all on four is a fixed prosthesis, a, a, a horseshoe of teeth, as we say, um, that encompasses all of the teeth and all of the pink tissues all in one unit. Um, an overdenture uh, is typically a removable snap in prosthesis that engages locators individually or a bar um, or um, fabricating some sort of titanium bar that has veneering porcelain on it or individual crowns that are cementing onto it um, or you know your traditional hybrid where it is a titanium bar with denture teeth that are processed onto it um, i'll be honest with you i have i i don't make hybrids meaning dent denture teeth processed on a titanium bar um, i i will only do that for a patient if they have a a opposing removable denture. Um, I'll make a hybrid for them in that case. Other than that, I don't do any hybrids over hybrids um, or any hybrids against natural teeth. Um, just in my experience, you know, from my residency and, and you know, last 10 years of practice, um, you know, the wear, the wear on the, on the denture teeth can be pretty, um, can be a lot. Um, and you can lead to fractures and things breaking. And I'll show you some, you know, some of the issues and repairs that we've done for a lot of folks as hybrids as well. You know, one of the big factors that you take into your diagnostic planning for these cases, um, it's your restorative space. Um, you need to, you know, figure out where your incisal plane or occlusal plane is going to be, where your number eight and number nine are going to be. And kind of work backwards from there. Um, you can see that you know traditional crown and bridge restorations can be modeled after teeth, but an all-on four or full arch restoration is typically thicker, taking into consideration the uh, pink tissues. Typically, a zirconia or porcelain restoration is about 15 millimeters. An acrylic or hybrid is anywhere from about 18 to 20 millimeters. Um, there are a lot of innovations now and in new products that are hitting the market where you can get zirconia porcelain down to, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 millimeters. Um, you know, it just depends on what works best in your hands. Um, I typically, everything, just about everything is monolithic zirconia with, you know, some sort of staining porcelain on there. Um, I have found that, you know, that just reduces the maintenance, reduces the chance of things breaking. Um, if something's going to break, the prosthesis is going to snap, break in half. Um, and at that point for us to remill or, or reprint something for you, you know, in a matter of hours, a day or so, it's, it's not the end of the world. 
Um, if you have a large metal frame with all this veneering porcelain on it and something chips, um, it's hard to repair. You can't really treat that that well. You have to redo everything. Um, so you have to take into consideration your, you know, your maintenance for your patient and what's going to be easiest um, and work best depending on the patient's situation. Material selection is very, very important. Um, this just kind of shows you the difference of when you're looking at a natural tooth versus a single implant restoration versus um, a, a hybrid or a full arch restoration taken into consideration. Um, the incisal edge in each, each photograph does not change, but you can see how your respective implant leveling and implant position can change from treatment to treatment. This is important because a lot of times what happens is patient comes into your office and you look and you say, oh my God, you have so much bone. Well, if you're not able to envision, you know, where your incisal edge needs to change, let's say it doesn't need to change, but and I'll, I'll, give you an, I'll give you an example that happens a lot on the mandible. Patient comes in, you know, they need teeth out, let's say because of decay. Um, if you've ever seen or if you're familiar with what we call an hourglass mandible, um, you know, the, the, the bone supports the teeth and then the bone tethers like this and then comes down like that. Um, a lot of those cases, when you look at when the teeth are removed and you reduce the bone, um, in some of those cases, there will be no more bone left to place implants. So you just want to be very conscious about when you're looking at these things is, is you have to, you know, look several steps ahead into your planning as far as what will work and what won't work. Another common issue on the maxilla is, let's say you have a patient that is edentulous upper and has a lower partial combination syndrome, for example. They typically have pneumatized sinuses and so they have you know posterior hypertrophy where um, the upper back part of the jaw is drooping down a little bit. Well, if you have to cut all that bone upwards and a little bit in the anterior part of the maxilla, um, and this, and you're going to enter the sinus space, um, that doesn't work out too well because you can't reduce bone and open the sinuses. You'll have very difficult issue closing it. And so sometimes in those cases, as much as it may not make sense, you have to do a bilateral sinus lift where you increase the bone height in the back of the jaw and then come back in six months and reduce and cut that bone back up to create the space for your prosthesis. Otherwise, if you don't create the space, things may break and fracture very easily for your patient. This kind of shows you, you know, when we start looking at, you know, where things are going to fit. That's typically how you can see how much bone is removed from surgery. Um, we just kind of chop the whole ridge off, typically about six, seven millimeters, sometimes up to about 10 millimeters. And this kind of shows you the difference where, you know, you can see in this example, um, you know, I, I, I didn't really change incisal edge that much, um, but you can see, I, 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 if anything, I may have lengthened it maybe about a millimeter just to create some overjet and overbite for the patient. But if you're measuring upwards, you can see um, from where the natural teeth are to where the immediate prosthesis is in place, um, how much you have to go up. So when we talk about, you know, hybrids and complications, these are a lot of the issues that I've, I've dealt with in the past with, you know, inheriting a lot of these cases that are done. Um, I can tell you here, when we look at the hybrid, all of these hybrids are not thick enough. Um, you know, the, the substructure bar is very thin. There's a very minimal amount of acrylic around the teeth. Um, and so patients just keep fracturing, breaking, fracturing, breaking, fracturing, breaking. Um, and it's very hard to repair these in the mouth. Um, it takes a lot of chair time to repair them in your office. And then, you know, if you tell your patient, I have to take your teeth from you and send them to a lab for two weeks to reprocess all the teeth back in place, um, and you don't have any type of backup ready for them, it, it's typically a very unpleasant conversation that may not happen. This is an example um, of a patient that had an upper denture opposing a lower hybrid. Um, and you can see where the metal and where things broke. Um, 
And this is, you know, we hear a lot, well, oh, well, you know, it's a denture against against the hybrid. You know, how 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 much can the patient actually bite, for example? Um, that's an example you can see. I mean, a patient snapped the metal right through uh, right through the metal, right through the prosthesis. This is uh, this was an example of a, a gentleman that just had um, his upper arch restored about two years ago. Um, had been dealing with fracture after fracture after fracture after fracture after fracture. The upper left picture shows he, he broke the whole distal extension, snapped the bar, the metal titanium bar in place. You can see his teeth are all worn down. The upper right picture, you can see um, that was um, his dentist's uh, attempt of a repair. Um, unfortunately, you can see that was how the patient was walking around um, with all of that repair material on there and, and just it was not a clean job. Um, so he came, he came to our office looking for a better solution. Um, we took him apart, converted everything over. We made, um, I made a, a zirconia, um, that's a monolithic um, full arch restoration uh, for the patient, something that's really strong, solid, um, is not going to break, cause him any type of issues. And um, he's been, I mean, now it's a year and a half later. Um, he's been doing really, really well. Um, taking care of his lower teeth and dealing with his perio. Um, but this is just an example where, you know, you look at the acrylic hybrid. Um, I didn't think there was enough inner arch space there. For whatever reason, the, the, the distal extension cantilevers were probably two to three times longer than they needed to be. Um, but this is a very typical that, 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 that we see all the time. Um, this is an example of zirconia. Um, this breaks as well. Um, that photo that you see right there in the center is a Procera implant bridge. That's a, a solid zirconia bar with zirconia crown cemented onto it. And then the other photos, those are monolithic or single zirconia, solid zirconia substructures um, with cracks and crazed lines going through them. So, you know, it, it, it happens um, on occasion. Um, it happens to everybody. Um, it could be anything from the the puck of zirconia that you buy from the manufacturer to the steps into the lab or even to, you know, uh, your adjustments on the day of delivery, for example. There's a lot of factors that can contribute. Unfortunately, it's very hard to figure out why these things happen in a lot of cases. And finally, when you kind of look at, you know, the full arch restoration and planning, this is not a situation that you really ever want to be in. Um, you know, your patients are paying significant amounts of money to have rehabs done. Um, and if you produce something like this, well, um, it's a very unpleasant situation to be in because that is what we call the transition zone, transition line. Um, that is something that's measured, you know, immediately from the first consult you have with your patient. I always ask them, give me a big, big, big smile. Smile as big as you can. I tell them, smile, you know. Show me everything you got because you want to see where their lip goes because you need to cut above that so that way when they smile, they don't show any of that transition. And, you know, if we try to mask it or build a flange up, well, now you've just created a, a hygiene issue for the patient as well. Um, so you just, you know, you, you really want to just make sure you're planning this as well as you can possibly plan. So this is an example. This is the patient that had a, a class two deep bite. You can see when he bites together, his lower teeth were impinging on the upper palate, um, due to decay, perio, um, all the teeth really needed to come out. Um, what we did was we designed upper and lower uh, immediate dentures, they're duplicated to create a clear surgical guide. Teeth are extracted and removed. The surgical guide is fit in the place. And that surgical guide you can see is telling me where to cut. Um, and you can actually take your burr right, in, right into those lines and you can score the bone or cut the bone so that you create a, a line or a perforation. Um, and that's basically where we're measuring from our incisal edge upwards as far as where things need to be. That's the bone leveled off. 
We check to make sure everything is nice and balanced in the face. We don't want ridges to be lopsided or anything like that. All of our implants are placed. So you can see where the natural teeth were and where the implants are now. There's a significant difference as far as the positioning of where um, things are going to be. We fill all the sockets with particulate bone because we want a nice smooth ridge. I don't want any um, deficiencies or any craters in there. That's a hygiene issue. Um, we cut the tissue. And then you can see we placed multi-unit abutments, which change the angulation of the screw. So rather than the implant coming straight out of the face, we change the angulation so that everything comes out from the lingual or the occlusal side of the teeth. And the surgical guide is cut and open from the lingual side so that way we can look at during surgery and make sure that we're placing these multi-unit abutments um, at the correct angle. Um, I will tell you, I've come across several folks that do this later on, um, you know, four to six months after the implants are placed. Um, I've never done that. Um, we place the abutments at the time of surgery because they're torqued in and then bone is filled in there. If you try to do it later and you get some bone growth over your implant, um, sometimes you have to go in there and remove a little bit of that bone so that you can seat that abutment. In these cases, the bone will actually grow up, up under the abutment. Same thing is completed on the lower. You can see the difference of the jaws from before and after. Everything is cut and leveled. Implants are placed. Bone is filled into all the sockets. And these are the restorations that are put in place, how our patient leaves. You can see the Panorex x-ray that's taken afterwards. So this you can see is a traditional all on four. And then what we do is we place some um, uh, extra implants just to kind of eliminate the cantilever for the patient. These are what the reline dentures look like in place. And then this is final restoration two years later patient is doing really well. This is an example of where the patient wanted the upper and lower done. Now, you know, we're not the type of office where if you come in, just say, take my teeth out. We just take them out right away. We still do a full charting. If we can save your teeth, it's still discussed with you or it's an option. Um, just because, you know, due diligence, I, 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 I go over every option or I make every option available to my patient so that they're you know, they have informed consent. They know what they're getting into. Last thing you ever want to do is take out someone's teeth and they come back at you and say, well, you know, I could have saved my teeth, for example. Um, so you just want to make sure a patient knows what they're getting into because this was an example where the upper arch really couldn't do much with it because of a lot of recurrent decay. Um, but if you look at the lower front teeth, they're okay. They're just worn down a little bit. The problem with her is that she has no bone distal to that to have implants, and she does not want to continue wearing a removal partial denture. And so she had elected to remove her lower anterior teeth because we needed to engage all that good bone in that chin space in order to create a restoration for her. So you can kind of see on the x-ray where if, she, if we were to keep the front teeth, um, you know, you might maybe get one implant in, but there's no way you're going to develop enough posterior teeth for her to function and, and be happy. Um, and then you have to obviously consider more restorations on the front teeth cosmetically because she's also not happy with that. So she decided to remove her teeth. This kind of shows you how we, you know, set the teeth and create things. Our surgical guides are made. And then we go into surgery and go through the same steps as before and create her temporaries that are placed in. Now we're taking a final impression. These are how we make our jigs. We section them, fit them in place, loot them. Everything is open tray impression. I never take closed tray impressions. Um, I, I've, I'm considering digital impressions at this time, but I'm also just waiting a little bit just to see what the research and time kind of shows. This is a wax up. This is a screw retained wax up that's completed for the patient to visualize where, you know, your edges, where your teeth are. 
and then it is duplicated into a screw retained provisional for the patient. They wear this for typically one to three weeks. We make changes, fine tune the occlusion, and then copy these into the final zirconia restoration. Those are the final restorations. That's monolithic zirconia, just with some pink porcelain added on, um, and then some superficial staining of the teeth. Um, and she's ecstatic. This is now we are, I think she's about three or four years out. Um, all of our patients are on three month recalls for hygiene, cleaning. Um, we're very aggressive with the maintenance as far as making sure our patients have water picks, uh, making sure they're clean. Um, we do remove the prosthesis on occasion if it's needed. Um, if it's not, we don't. And then all of our patients have bite guards so that they're um, not grinding or, or, or beating up their teeth or implants at night, reducing any chance of TMJ issues developing or any myofascial uh, dysfunction. Um, this was an example of a patient who had a full arch restoration that was completed. Um, this is interesting because she had a upper hybrid done. Um, they built a flange um, and then they also restored it in a class two deep bite. So you can see this is a very, 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 very destructive bite. You can look at the bottom and you can see the wear, the, the wear pattern on the bottom and how things were fitting together. So we take a series of x-rays. She's got, I think she had eight or nine implants. Um, all of them have, you know, crustal bone loss, 25% bone loss or so. So we decide and we say, you know, in a case like this, we prepare for, for removing everything and restarting, or we say, if we can save something, we're going to save it. We'll use it if we can. Uh, but obviously, you know, when, when your patient's under sedation, asleep, you know, you, you can't have these conversations. So a lot of times you have to plan for this ahead of time. The patient has to consent to this ahead of time. Um, and we tell them, I mean, you know, you have a, a, a prosthesis that's no good. Um, it's a hygiene issue. Um, it has to be drilled and cut off. Um, you may have implants that fall out, or if the implants are no good, we have to be ready to remove them. Um, and I have to be ready on the restorative side and on the lab side is have teeth ready because if this prosthesis can't go back in, um, and we get to the point where we take everything out, um, we have to be able to load and put a new prosthesis in. So we kind of knew, or, or you know, what was going to come of this. The prosthesis was taken out. Very interesting. It had um, it had five of the implants with custom abutments and were cement retained, and the um, two implants were screw retained. And then, for whatever reason, in the front there was a locator on the implant. I have no idea. I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. So you can kind of see that was what was underneath. Um, patient had a lot of food, a lot of debris in there. The pocketing around the implants was really not good. We had seven, eight, nine millimeter pocketing. And so, you know, we get in there and we start cutting and taking apart. And you can see all of the implants just have bone loss. And so we said, you know what? It's just better that we take them out, start over, and start from scratch. So all of the implants are removed. These are unique drivers that can fit into the implant and then remove the implant for you. Those are all the implants removed. They came out um, pretty easily, honestly. Um, I suspect some of them were probably not integrated at, at, at some point. This is everything after. Reduce the ridge. Try in our guide. Begin placing our, impl our new implants. Those are checking the directions of all the implant access holes. And then we're placing bone. We take our bone into syringes and that way we can inject. We fill the whole ridge around all the implants. And then we cut the tissue so that way we can suture the tissue and develop very nice, a, a, a nice bed of keratinized gingiva around the implants. This is what the patient looks like when they're closed up. We come in with our denture, we pick it up, we drill the holes, we get an impression, 
Holes are drilled in the denture. These are what will connect to the denture. It's fit in place. We inject material in there. And then this all gets unscrewed. We have a model made at time of surgery. And then we cut the whole denture down. And this is what our new prosthesis will look like. You can see the old prosthesis or I, I like this photo because it shows you the, the, the old permanent final restoration versus our new one. And you can notice some significant differences. Although thicker and stronger, we always let the patient know the prosthesis is going to be very thick in the beginning because I don't want this thing to break immediately after implants are placed. Same thing is done on the lower. That's how the patient leaves. And we always see them 48 hours after. And now these are her prototype or the next set of teeth that we're making for her. And we're, we're hoping to make some final decisions here um, in the next handful of weeks or so. Um, a lot of these cases have been kind of on the back burner since COVID as well. Just a lot of patients waiting in their temporaries until they're comfortable uh, to come back in and finish their cases. Um, but she's been stable in her in her prototype, and once she's happy with her shade and her color, it'll get finalized into the zirconia material. So that kind of shows you radiographically. So just to kind of point out real quick, if you look at where um, we we had reduced about four or five millimeters of bone, so you can see um, just from you know the medial aspect of sinus to sinus where we're able to place all of those implants compared to where implants were before the mandible the three implants on the lower right those were her existing ones we actually used those they weren't that bad and then uh we placed two more implants and honestly you know looking at this you know you always look back at your cases and you critique uh really should have placed three implants on the lower left just to balance it a little bit more and a little bit better um but you know it, it is what it is um if you know any questions um uvo i don't know uh, okay. if, if people are typing yeah, couple, questions all right there are a couple questions there i uh, just want to see if i want to uh let me call on mohammed you want, uh, me, uh, you want to take the screen back or uh no 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 go, go ahead uh, just leave okay it. All right. If you if you have a question uh, and uh, that you, you want to ask yourself, just uh, raise your hand and I'll give you the microphone. Uh, Mohammed Al Tabatai Tabatabai, uh, can you hear me? All right. Uh, I'm I'm just going to read out um, a question here. By, yeah. Yeah. Like, can we do uh, implant immediate implant for a diabetic patient? Yeah, yeah, of course. We treat, um, we we treat. I mean, uh, I'd say probably half our patients are diabetics. I mean, it's 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 everybody over the age of fifty is a diabetic pretty much. Um, <laughs> we we treat a lot of lot of medically compromised patients, but um, we don't. And we don't treat, so we get a medical clearance for just about every single patient we treat. So if you have diabetes, we are, we are going to get an INR, um, get a blood glucose level. Um, and obviously if it, if it's too high for our liking, um, then you're not, you're not going to have surgery with us. Um, and this, this happens, um, a few times. Um, where the patients, their blood sugar is just not controlled. Um, and we tell them, you know, we, we're, we're happy to help. And, and uh, you know, typically it's a, a four to six month period of time where that patient is working very, very closely with their primary care physician or their primary care provider um, and trying to get their blood sugar in a healthy uh, range. Um, and when that happens, um, we're ready to move on on their on their surgery. But 
Um, yeah, I mean, we treat a tremendous amount of patients that are all diabetics. Um, they have to be controlled. They have to have medical clearance. Um, their INR and their blood glucose number typically were like around 6.3, 6.5 and less. Um, otherwise, we just, you know, we tell the patient, I mean, you know, your, if your blood sugar is too high, it's not worth doing implants because there's a high chance they're just going to fail. So okay. um, it's, it's, it's not worth it in our opinion. All right. Another question here is uh, how do you, you know, for the in case of the class three socket, how do you deal with uh, the, the, the recession uh, afterwards? Well, we try to graft. So if, if there's a significant amount of recession and bone loss, um, we try to build, build the ridge up as much as we can. Um, even if we gain just a small portion amount, um, it's enough. If, if it's a case where, where there's still a lot of recession and it's a hygiene issue, um, I'll typically try to develop some sort of restoration that's, that's hygienic. Um, but that's something where we have to have a conversation um, with the patient as far as, you know, how, how do we rehab them? How do we restore them? Um, because we treat a lot of folks that have had, you know, um, partial resections, for example. Um, sometimes you have to create like a substructure that has crown cemented onto it. Um, or sometimes you have to have the conversation about making teeth that come in and out so that they can take them out and keep things nice and clean. Um, you got to remember, you, you still have to play the doctor hat. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times as dentists, um, and what can tend to happen is your patient comes in and, um, you know, they say, well, I, I, I want this, this, and this, and this. I want implants, and I want them here, and this is what I want. And you still have to play the doctor card. It's very, it's very easy to, to, you know, just place an implant and put a restoration. Um, but, the, you know, if your patient's going to have complications, issues as a result of it later on, um, you, you have to try to at least guide them and have those conversations um, with your patient so that way they know kind of what their limits are and what their limitations are not. You saw that last patient that we did. Yes. Uh, you know, the first thing I ask her is, is how do you clean this? Mm -hmm. She says, well, I don't. Mm -hmm. And basically what happened was, is a couple of years ago, she had it done. And you can see how much bone was lost on those implants. Um, and th this is very, very reoccurring. I mean, I mean, this happens a lot. Um, and that's where you just, you know, uh, you know, you sometimes you just shake your head a little bit, but um, you, you just, you have to kind of, plan for these things and take into account. And if it can't be done to a certain degree of success, then, you know, it, it, you should change the treatment plan or figure something else out. All right. So that, that's kind of segues into the other question here. We are talking about uh, what are the contraindications to a full arch, uh, you know, case? Yeah, what, you know, and, and what other alternatives can you offer? I mean, I guess you're talking about... I mean, re removable, removable is, is the alternative option. Um, I mean, really contraindication, I mean, it, it could be anything and everything. Um, you know, hygiene is one thing, you know, uh, it's never really been an issue. I've, I've had one patient um, where she just refuses. I mean, she just tells you, I don't, I don't brush my teeth. And I just respectfully just tell her, I said, I, I, I'm sorry, but, um, you know, you just spent a significant amount of money having this restoration done. Um, and, and she doesn't, every time she comes in, there's just food everywhere. She doesn't clean it. Um, so you're always going to deal with issues like that. But as far as, you know, your contra contraindications, you know, hygiene is an issue tissue support. If you need a lot of tissue support, you have to consider removable. Um, but, um, you know, as far as the anatomical and, and stuff like that, uh, it's really, it's, it's a patient compliant thing. Okay. What I will tell you is, is, is you know, in the last five years with, with Facebook, social media, um, commercials on TV, um, clear choice, for example, um, the public is, is very educated on what is out there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it used to be, you went and saw your dentist in whatever they told you in their little office, that was your only means of, of, you know, what you can have done. Um, and that was just how dentistry was for the most part. If it was something you couldn't tackle, 
um, you would take the case to a specialist or, or, or a friend or um, a study club. Um, patients now, they can go on and they can see my surgeries probably. They can see your surgeries. They can see your treatments. Um, you can get treatments online. You can sit on Facebook and talk to other people that have had this done. Um, and it's a very, very powerful tool because it does educate your patient. I can't tell you how many people come in and just say, I want the all on four. <laughs> Even I, I, I have people that come in and they have all their teeth. And really, really, this, I, I, this has happened a dozen times. I'm not kidding. They come in and they, they have all their teeth. They're healthy teeth. They're just yellow. And they come in and they say, I want the all on four because my friend got it and they have beautiful teeth. And we look at it and I explain to them, you have to, you have to educate them. You have to tell them, you know, the all on four or the replacement of teeth. It's you're taking out bad teeth and they go, well, I, well, I don't want that, but I, I want, you know, they have such beautiful teeth and we just tell them, you know, maybe veneers or, or let's just do some bleaching. Um, so it's, it's, uh, the word implant means a lot. Uh, people come in and say, yeah, I want to get implants. Sometimes they're talking about a crown. Sometimes they're talking about veneers. Um, it's usually referencing some sort of cosmetic change. Yes. Uh, but that's, that's like the marketing. That's the key word or the key object that is marketed to the patient. I mean, nobody, wh when, when do you see, you know, commercials on TV for, for dentures and crowns and, and root canals? <laughs> those are, those are things that are, referencing a very unpleasant time in dentistry, getting a root canal, getting dentures, um, you know, now getting, you know, all on four, that's like going to, you know, get your hair done at the salon or get laser eye surgery. Uh, for a lot of folks, it's a thing where um, it, it, it's a life-changing uh, procedure for them. So mm -hmm. contraindications, there's really not a lot, you know, the medical side of things, the anatomical, structural, restorative space, traditional type of things. Um, but a lot of it is just talking with your patient, making sure they understand. Um, it's like saying, Hey, um, your hands aren't working well, your feet don't work well, we're going to cut them off and we're going to replace them with these prosthetics that are going to work to maybe about 90% as well as your other hands will work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, even you have, you have to have conversations with your patients where, you know, you have to learn how to talk. You have to um, believe it or not, but, uh, you've had a few people that, you know, learning where their teeth are because now there's no pseudo, there's no proprioception. You know, you tap on teeth, you feel it, you tap on implants, you may not feel it. So, you know, there's a healing hands health society presents dental webinar series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 